here again. Um, just a reminder to the speakers, please pull the microphone closer to you um, when you're speaking so that we have better uh, audio in here. So we'll get started back up again. We're on BDCP effects analysis presentations, and Jennifer, you to make a I do need to make a correction. I was mistaken. There is fishing in the four bay, although it's unofficial for the most part. So I just wanted to clarify that for the record, and I apologize for that. Okay, so um, uh, one of the major um, um, uncertainties is uh, how do we operate the proposed North Delta intakes. Right now, um, the conservation measure uh, one includes what we call the bypass flow requirements for um, the North Delta intake diversions. And these bypass flows um, were uh, envisioned for several reasons. One, uh, primarily to uh, to make sure that there is no increased upstream tidal transport because of the diversion in the channels that are downstream. Um, also, to support the salmon, salmonid migration, the uh, also uh, and uh, try to preserve the natural hydrograph, which which can, uh, which generally is a cue to a lot of the important biological functions. The, uh, the bypass flow uh, magnitudes were selected such that the potential for any potential for increased reverse flows in the Sacramento River is minimized. Um, and also the flows are expected to help minimize the predation effects at the um, intakes and the downstream locations. So in general, um, the rules are broken into three different um, parts. One is a... Uh, um, there is an initial pulse protection where the intakes are um, primarily uh, operating at what we call as the constant low-level pumping, where um, this is uh, generally during the December-June period. And the, according to this, under this rule, uh, at each intake, um, one could, uh, we could divert only up to 300 CFS at each intake, such that the Sacramento River flow uh, never goes below 5,000 CFS. And once the pulse protection period is passed, um, what we, we go into what we call the post-pulse operations. Um, these are prog these are uh, basically bypass flow requirements that progressively um, become less constraining on the diversion. Um, so we we have them broken them as level one, level two, level three, and. As the uh, season is progressing and as the, we see high flows in the river exist, or sustained high flows in the river, then uh, we progressively move from level one, level two to level three, where level three being the less, least constraining of the three. Um, this is a, a graphic just to show how those post-pulse operations work. Um, I, um, couple of things. One, this graphic was made for um, the 15,000 CFS intake capacity, but it was never updated to the latest proposal of 9,000 CFS. So I just want to use this as a, an example of how the flows were, uh, the bypass flow criteria works. So what you see here on the x-axis is the Sacramento River flow upstream of the North Delta intakes. The y-axis is showing the bypass flow, that is the flow downstream of the intakes. Um, and also it's also showing the available export on that same axis. If you, this black line represents um, the one-to-one -one, uh, line, which is basically if you, the, the, along that line, the amount of flow upstream is the same as amount of flow downstream. The, the green triangles here uh, represent the amount of actual bypass flows under the proposed bypass requirements, flow requirements. And you see that up to about 11,000 to 12,000 CFS, the, the bypass flow is the same as the flow upstream of the intakes. And from there on, there is a certain divergence from that one-to-one -one line. So if you look at the blue diamonds here, that indicates the amount of diversion 
that's and uh, that's being occur that's occurring at the intakes under the rules. So it's so even at, after 12,000 CFS, we are not allowed to divert the entire any flow entire flow above that 12,000 CFS. We only get a fraction of that. So um, this the magenta line here that it shows the the amount of uh, Sacramento River flow that's being bypassed, and the percentage is showed on this axis. So you can see at the 12,000 CFS, we have about 95% of CF, uh, the flow above 12,000 CFS is still being uh, left uh, or uh, being uh, bypassed. Um, so the, we expect to see about for 9,000 CFS, we need at least uh, around 20, 27, 20, uh, 28,000 CFS in the river. To, to get the full 9,000 CFS diversion. Any any questions on this rule or? So we incorporated this uh, this criteria into the um, Calcin 2 modeling, and this um, and for this uh, rule to work, we need the Calcin 2 model should uh, have some uh, knowledge of what the daily variability would be. So we had to modify the model to incorporate some daily variability in in the in there. This plot is uh, showing an example of uh, how the uh, what the river bypass flow would be looking like under a historical condition. So this, uh, sorry, not, not a historical condition, but for one of the uh, year that we simulated, it's the 1988. It's a critical year, and uh, so there are several lines on this plot here. But I'll try to walk you through. Oops, wrong one. Um, so what you see here is the, the gray shading indicates the North Delta bypass rule level. And these are the level one, two, three, if you remember. And level zero is what indicates the initial pulse protection that we have. So this is a critical year uh, where the, the, the flow, the dark, bl the black line is the Sacramento River flow at Freeport. And the red line is the requirement based on those rules that I just described uh, for the bypass flows. The green line is the amount of diversion that's occurring, and the blue, lighter blue line there is the actual bypass flow that we expect to see downstream of the intakes. And what you notice there is that if you focus on the December through or um, June period here, that's when the, these uh, bypass, the post pulse operations are generally in the effect, um, or the bypass rules are in the effect. Um, the, uh, in, during the very early uh, December, you see a, a pulse protection period where um, the, that was the first storm in the year season, and uh, generally that storm is not do anything, nothing diverted at that time. Um, only diversion that's allowed is the constant low-level pumping, which is about um, at the three intakes. Uh, as long as Sacramento River flow is about 5,000 CFS, it's up to 900 CFS is allowed to be diverted. So a total of 900 CFS. So, and then can I interrupt just real uh, here? I'm over here. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah, I, I heard from there for a minute. Just a real que <laughs> quick question, just for clarification. In the the no no pulse, is that for turbidity for that that first first um, bit bit? What, what what's the reason for not taking any of that so, first pot, um, pulse? I look to Mike, but uh, in a minute. Right. Yes. So. That's generally when the primary migration starts for the winter run. Thanks. Um, so, so once we are past uh, move from the initial pulse protection to the post pulse, um, we are at level one. That's where we start. And under level one, you can see that we we are not able to pump anything about this low level pumping because the Sacramento River flow is still pretty low, around 13,000 CFS, maybe here. Um, in February, though, we, we have another storm um, event, or another runoff event um, that results in some diversion here. In fact, we do hit 9,000 CFS once there, and we sustain five, uh, about 5,000 CFS for, um, I guess this is January, most of January here, and then we, the division ramps down back as soon as the Sacramento River flow uh, goes below the bypass flow requirement. 
and we stay at the constant low-level pumping for most of the six months there. Here is a, another example. Uh, this is an above normal year where we have uh, sustained high flows in the system. So we have the initial pulse protection that occurs uh, in the December year where we don't get any, uh, our only division we have is the constant low level pumping. And once we go through that, um, once the initial pulse protections or the post pulse operations start, uh, we quickly move to the up to 9,000 CFS division and the, the division is sustained uh, through most of the season, can, mainly because there are sustained high flows in the river. So that's, that's basically how the bypass flows are, the requirements are working uh, right now, or we, at least. Um, <clears throat> this is just uh, showing the DSM-2 grid modifications to simulate the not delta division. So the grid uh, has been modified to include three new, uh, to reflect the three new proposed intakes in the North Delta. Um, basically, they are treated as uh, diversions, point diversions coming out of those three nodes at those locations. And um, again, the grid and uh, the changes are described in the EARE as Appendix 5A. So. Um, so, in addition to the bypass flow rules that are modeled in CALSIM 2, uh, the the uh, actual daily or the the division on a sub daily level or on a tidal time scale is simulated in DSM2. So, we, in DSM2 itself, we uh, take the amount of daily division that calcium is projecting would occur, and then we distribute that between the three intakes, um, and such that the uh, at, we divert from each intake such that the the downstream velocity is at at least 0.4 feet per second. The velocity we used is the cross-sectional average uh, velocity, but uh, this is um, primarily a surrogate to what the sweeping velocity requirements would be for the fish screens that are being proposed. Um, and uh, the division is uh, operated such that uh, we, uh, we uh, get the division as much as possible early, as early in the day. Uh, day. Um, and then also the other part, we other criteria we used is we prioritize the north delta, northernmost intake first. We try to divert as much as possible from that intake, and then as we, uh, we go f further south. So, um, any, any questions so far on, on that one? So this is basically to provide you how the, um, the, the flows we see in the Sacramento River downstream of the intakes, what, how did we come up with those flows? And, and those flows understand the changes, or, or the, the, those flows are based on the changes we know that may occur under the plan, which includes the Fremont Weir changes, includes the uh, operational changes in relation to the restoration and sea level rise in the delta. Um, the flows also account for the not delta diversion that is being proposed. So by the time we see the amount of flow we see at um, at Georgiana Slow already accounts for all these changes that are part of the plan. So we um, I'll be diving into uh, some focused analysis on uh, seeing whether or not the bypass flow bypass flows that we have and the various other components of the BDCP proposal. Um, uh, meet the objective, or not the goal, one of the goals of the bypass flows, which is to minimize any um, increase in the um, frequency or duration or, or the magnitude of the reverse flows at Georgiana Slope in the Sacramento River. So the primary focus of this analysis in, is in um, December through June period. That's when the bypass flow requirements are, um, uh, are, are in place and they are um, protective of the fish that are migrating during that season. So there, are, there were three questions that we were looking at as part of this. Um, does uh, BDCP increase the frequency of the reverse flows in uh, Sacramento River at Georgiana Slows? So there are, we do get reverse flows even today, we, um, because depending on the amount of flow coming down the Sacramento River. Um, it, we, we tend to see 
that on a tidal basis, some in, on some days when the flow is very low, the Sacramento River would reverse, go in upstream direction. Um, so the question, the first question we are trying to answer is, do we change the frequency of those reverse flows? Um, the second question is, does the BDCP contribute to increase fraction of Sacramento River diverted into Georgiana Slough in any way? So are we seeing whether there's more flow from Sacramento River entering into Georgiana Slough? Uh, this is of a particular concern because um, the, for the migrating salmon, it's, you don't want to increase the risk of entering into the central delta when they are migrating. And the third question, this is more specific, is similar to the second one, but very specific. So in, in the event of Sacramento River reversing uh, on a tidal basis, are we increasing the fraction of that reversing Sacramento, Sacramento River flow into the Georgiana Slough? So this is more specific. So if, you, if there is a, um, a fish that's migrating down and it encounters this reverse flow, and are, is, a, is there a possibility for the increased risk of that and training that river, uh, because of the reversing. So there are three specific questions we tried to answer. Uh, the very first one, uh, I, I'll go back to that. Uh, so the very first question, we simply based it on the 15-minute DSM-2 results um, just downstream of Georgiana Slough. We basically counted up in each month how many times we have reverse flow under each of the, the under the baseline condition and the under the BDCP conditions. And we looked at how did that manage, the percentage of change for each of the, each month over the 16 year period that DSM2 has been simulated. For the questions two and three, um, there, there could be uh, three different conditions that could occur at the junction of uh, Georgia and Sloan Sacramento River. It could, uh, what uh, each of those diagrams are representing is that, so that's the, um, the circle is the junction. This is the Georgiana Slough. This is the Sacramento River upstream of Georgiana. This is downstream of Georgiana. The, for, under the condition one, you may have a reverse flow occurring downstream of Georgiana, but the upstream flow is still going uh, in the pos positive direction or going to a, uh, it's still in going downstream. So the second condition, the um, we have an upstream, uh, reversal downstream of Georgiana as well as the upstream of Georgiana Slough. And a third condition, we do not have any reversal. So there are three different conditions that could occur. And in the condition one, um, the, we, uh, both the f flow coming from downstream as well as the upstream would contribute to the Georgiana Slough. But in the condition two, we only, uh, the, most of the Georgiana Slough flow would come from the downstream direction only. And in condition three, it comes only from the upstream direction. And in estimating the fraction of the Sacramento River as a total or just this reversing component, we use these individual cons conditions. We looked at, we took the 15 minute output from DSM2. We classified the results based on which condition it comes through uh, or each of those time steps fall into. And then we looked at um, uh, if it is condition one, we assume that the amount of flow coming into Georgiana is going to be in the ratio of the upstream to the downstream, uh, or the propo uh, or proportions of the upstream and downstream in the condition one. In the condition two, entire 100% of the flow is coming from the downstream. In the condition three, nothing comes from the downstream, 100% comes from the upstream. So we used, uh, we summarized all that information over a month and average the results to see how did these, um, the, what is the net effect of this? Uh, is, are we changing the total fractions in any way um, or the fraction of the reverse flows in any way? So um, this is a plot um, um, which this is demonstrating the percentage of time uh, in each month that is reversing in Sacramento flow. And we have averaged the results over the 16 years here just to convey the message, but um, the detailed results are um, the monthly table, uh, uh, monthly results are tabulated in the appendix 5C of the BDCP document. Um, and here, uh, there are several curves here. What 
I want you to focus here on is the dark black dashed line, and that's the no action alternative. Uh, that's the baseline condition. And the uh, if you can, rest of the color uh, colored lines are all, all the BDCP alternative four. Um, the four lines are basically the four decision tree scenarios, but. Uh, if you focus in the um, December through June period, you can see that the the frequency of them, um, the frequency of the uh, reverse flows is about the same, uh, or slightly less uh, compared to the baseline under the BDCP. So that's the that's the result. What we found when we did this accounting, essentially accounting of how many reverse flow conditions are. Uh, occurred over a month, and we did that for the 16 years um, and averaged it for each month to see how it changed. And what we are seeing is that the fraction is not, uh, it, the reverse flows are not getting, the frequency is not getting worse than what's under the uh, current conditions, essentially. Just a quick question. Did you do any comparison between the RMA and, and untrimmed results at, at Georgiana SLU? With DSM two to see if there was you know, you know some criteria for how that flow junction is yes. calibrated. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so I was just uh, diving into the result here, but yeah. uh, I will show you some. So we wanted to uh, uh, figure out how certain are we with this result. So we looked at, went back and checked whether DSM two is has been corroborated uh, reasonably. Um, we did, are we capturing the trends that we are seeing under RMA2 modeling? So I'll show, you, show that to you in a minute. Um, so this is a, another question we were trying to answer. This is the fraction, total fraction of Sacramento River flow. Is that getting, uh, are we, um, under BDCP, do we see more of Sacramento River flow entering into the Georgiana Slough? And again, um, Based on the analysis I described a few couple of slides earlier, and we did that analysis for the, all the 16 years and averaged it over the month, uh, over each of the mo each month. And if you focus on December through June, again you see that the total fraction is actually lower. Um, couple of couple of things happening here. One is the um, the uh, the North Delta diversion itself. There is a the net flow coming downstream is probably lower under the BDCP scenario, so it, obviously the fraction of that net flow is lower too. <coughs> so that's, that's, one, that's one primary reason. But there, there is a, I, I, that we think there is another reason why this may be happening, which I'll describe in a minute. Um, the third question we were trying to answer was the, uh, whether the reversing, if, if in, in the event of Sacramento River flow reversing, are we, uh, uh, is there more f amount of that flow entering Georgiana Slough? Again, the question, the answer we found was that it's not. Uh, the if, um, What we are seeing is that, in fact, it's actually lower than the no action alternative um, that we have simulated. So um, I know this may be a bit counterintuitive to many of us here, but uh, so we went ahead and tried uh, dive, uh, dived into uh, the details or detailed results to try and understand, make sense of why this is happening. So, um, what uh, what you see here on this slide is the we plotted the um, monthly river, uh, frequency of or the monthly fract percentage of reversals against the Sacramento River flow um, just downstream of the intakes. So, what what we are trying to see is. How is how are these frequencies changing with respect to the bypass flow that we have we have in the uh, that we simulated in the model? So, and what the, each of the curve represents the the EBC2, which is um, the current conditions. The EBC2 ELT ELT is early long term, and it represents the 2025 conditions. We have uh, about 15 centimeter sea level rise at that time. EBC2 LLT is at 2060. Again, uh, it would be no project condition at 2060. It has 45 centimeter sea level rise. ESO ELT is the BDCP, one of the BDCP scenarios at early long term. So it includes the 15 centimeter sea level rise and the 25,000 acre restoration on top of it. Um, and the ESO LLT is the 
uh, late long-term BDCP. Again, it includes 65,000-acre restoration with uh, 45 centimeter sea level rise. So those are, those are important to know. Those, uh, those changes are individually contributing to these changes. And um, what we are seeing here is that the, um, if, so this, you can't really discern what's happening here, but we've, we've fitted a generalized uh, additive models lines to this data here. And what you see here is that um, the, 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 the bottom two curves here are the BDCP scenarios, and the three in the curves, kind of the separated curves here are the three e baseline scenarios at uh, different time frames. And you, what we are seeing is that um, the amount of flow uh, below the intakes um, that's needed for no reversals is actually much lower under the BDCP compared to the, um, the other the baseline conditions. So, okay, so what, what's going on here again? So, so um, what this plot is showing is the, uh, the corroboration re result. Uh, basically, on the, the red line is showing the RMA, and the green line is showing DSM2, and this is at the early long term. I just used that as an example. And um, what you are seeing is the incremental change in the net flows in the, uh, this is at Georgia and Slu, and this is at Rio Vista. I want you to focus on a couple of things, places, the, primarily the uh, Dece December through June months where the Delta Cross Channel is closed and primary access to the Central Delta is only Georgia and Slu. So what this plot is showing us, there is some disagreement when the gate is open between the two models but generally both the models agree when the gate's closed. Um, so this is the, to answer a couple of things. One, to make sure the DSM-2 is actually uh, simulating the processes correctly, and uh, it's representing the hydrodynamics reasonably well. So what we are seeing is that Georgiana SLU, uh, the net flow is actually reducing um, in, under the BDCP condition with the restoration and the sea level rise. And the bottom plot is indicating that the the net flow in the Sacramento River, its main, main, main stem, is actually increasing. Uh, so, there is, so what under the restoration scenario, what we are seeing is that um, the, the flow split at Georgiana is changing such that we have more riverine condition under the Sacramento River and slightly tidal condition under the Georgia, in, in, in the Georgiana slow itself. And that kind of explains why the frequency of the reverse flows has reduced in the Sacramento River. So because of the restoration effects, we think the, um, the amount of uh, riverine conditions, or that riverine conditions have extended further down below Georgiana under the BDCP. So Sorry. can I back up that slide? So just for clarification, so the places where RMA and DSM-2 are not meeting up or when the Delta Cross Channel is open? Correct. That's okay. the times when the Cross Channel is opening. So, um, so we wanted to further confirm whether really restoration is the cause for these changes that we are seeing. So um, just a couple of, a few slides here just walking through what ha how the net flow in the Georgiana is, um, that what are the factors affecting the net flow in the Georgiana Slough? So this slide is just showing that the flow across the Georgiana Slough from Sacramento River to Mokhonni is generally linearly uh, related to the water level difference between the Sacramento River and the, and the Mokhonni. Just, uh, just the message that it is linearly related. Um, um, the, this slide here, um, Again, same set of scenarios that I described earlier, but what we plotted here is that, uh, again, the x-axis shows the flow downstream of the intakes. That's essentially the bypass flow. Um, and the, uh, on the y-axis, we are uh, plotting the, the gradient or the, or the difference in the state, water levels between Sacramento River and the Mokhumni. And what we are seeing there is that the, the the, what I mean, it, I guess the message is already clear that the net flow is decreasing, and we, what we, these plots are confirming is that the gradient is actually dropping. So the water level gradient between the Sacramento Riverside to the Mokhonni 
is actually lower under the BDCP scenarios. And therefore, you have more flow staying in the Sacramento River and less going into the Georgiana. That's primarily what we are seeing here. Oh, go ahead. Quick question. Do you, so, so there are, in those scenarios, you have restoration areas modeled in DSM-2. Correct. So is there a possibility that it's how the, it is modeled in DSM-2 is different than what is in RMA? It, the exchanges are, it, so fundamentally the stages are, are a little different, and that's what's driving Georgiana Slough. So that is way. possible, yes. There could be some differences, but then uh, that's the reason we went back and checked the corroboration results to make sure, are, is, even though the magnitudes may not be the same between the two models, are, we gen, are the two models showing generally the trend of uh, this reduced gradient and increased net flows? And that's what we found. Okay. So. so um, this plot is. Um, so we we try to understand why is this gradient again to answer the question: Is the restoration the reason, primary reason for all this? So we wanted to see what why is the gradient across the Georgiana Slough is lower under the BDCP scenarios, and to answer that question, we looked at how did the tidal range in the Sacramento River near Georgiana Slough is changing with each of these scenarios. So again, what you see here is that um, on the x-axis, uh, you see the Sacramento River flow downstream of the intakes. Y-axis, you see the mean tidal range um, and in the Sacramento River. And when, uh, we plot, when we plotted them against each other, what we are seeing is that the, um, the uh, two BDCP scenarios uh, at early long-term and late long-term, the tidal range is much more muted than the, uh, the uh, no, no project scenarios. And that's understandable. We, we, we are opening up large open water areas here in the BDCP, and we expect the tide to be uh, muted, attenuated. Um, so, the so I think part of the reason why the gradient is lowering down is this muting that's occurring primarily in the Sacramento River. So we just want to <laughs> further confirm whether or not that's happening. So we actually went ahead and did a sensitivity run where th this is the same plot as the previous one. And we just uh, did a, added a sensitivity run where we took the BDCP scenario and removed the restoration from it. So what you see here is that that orange curve, which is not very clearly visible, but it, it pretty much follows the EBC2, which is the baseline condition. Whereas our BDCP scenario with restoration is much further down. So this kind of, I mean, no question there that it is the restoration that's driving, that primarily driving the uh, tidal range. That's, that's what we're looking at. And, um, this is uh, just another plot where we tried to, we use the results from that sensitivity run where we see that um, uh, the so the, just to walk through the scenarios, the red line is the BDCP scenario with the restoration, and the green line, sorry, I reversed that. Uh, green line is the BDCP scenario with the restoration, and the red line is the BDCP scenario. Did I reverse that again? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, just uh, go, let's go with this one again. So the green line is the BCP scenario without the restoration, and the red is with restoration. And what we plotted is the gradient across the Georgiana slope. So this is the driver we think is that's causing this uh, flow split, change of flow split at the junction. And we are seeing that definitely if we did not have restoration, the flow split would be much closer to the, um, to the current conditions. This is, uh, again, those GAN curves we showed earlier, basically just uh, plotting the frequency um, of all the uh, frequency of the reverse flows uh, with the bypass flow in the Sacramento River. We just added the re no restoration sensitivity case on top of this, and it pretty much follows the uh, EBC, which is the existing uh, or the no project condition um, 
at early long term. And whereas the project, the scenarios with the restoration, they, there is a clear separation as to uh, the, where the rivers flow, or at what net flow in the river, you would see the rivers, flow, rivers flows in Georgia and Slo. And we see that there, again, it's just um, several analyses that were done to understand what, what is driving this and whether or not really the restoration um, which seems to be driving majority of this is the reason. So we do, that's all, uh, that each of this slide is just reaffirming that message that it is the restoration that's causing this to occur. So this is the last slide, basically the same message. We think that the attenuation that's occurring because of the tidal marsh restoration near Sacramento, in the Sacramento River is the primary reason why we uh, think the rest the reverse flows are um, reduced. Obviously, this wouldn't work if we didn't have the bypass flows in first place. So the by bypass flows are providing sufficient protection, but if the frequent uh, the mar marsh itself is actually helping, the restoration itself is actually helping uh, provide that, uh, enhance that protection. Um, and the, the driver is again the change in the gradient across the Georgiana Slough, and uh, the obviously that the stage is the re gradient is reducing under the BDCP scenarios compared to the um, to the uh, few, uh, no project conditions. So, any any questions? Okay, so we'll move on to the next topic here. You'll see the fish effects, I guess, uh, of, of this. Thanks, uh, Chandra. As Chandra indicated, I'll try and speak now to the analyses that actually focus on fish, although I think you'll appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. I'll just be like this. It's okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. 